mass unemployment, which was also a huge thing in Germany. But on the other hand, uh, in many cases, there was a reduction of work hours. So this reduction of working hours would be a good possibility to handle productivity gains if one would um, use this uh, in a consequent way. But uh, many years ago, this would rather lead to, um, to unemployment. And also, we had the situation that the working hours were prolonged. Which is which is negative consequences for our environment. So if the growth that was there led to more working hours, that meant that we had to use more natural resources. And from a point of view of the trade unions, the handling of this productivity gain if we don't want to stop it, which might also be a possibility, would be to shorten working hours or to maximize the use of resources, but this is not possible because of environmental reasons. I would like to ha ask something. Are you in the trade unions talking about decoupling so decoupling um, GDP growth on the one hand and use of resources on the other hand. Yes, this does play a role, the decoupling. The decoupling f of income, uh, GDP and prosperity. We are talking more and more about this in the trade unions. That even if we have uh, increasing income, we have less prosperity because actually productivity gains have negative consequences on the employees. So this is another, not the productivity gains that comes from better healthcare or better machines, but rather from a density of performance, less breaks, more longer working hours, etc. so that this increase of income is not a good thing anymore. Nobody wants that anymore. We are talking about this in the unions. So that actually increasing income is something negative. And the use of resources is another thing that we have because of growth. We have the problems that we use more and more resources and we only have a relative and not an absolute decoupling so that more growth means more using natural resources. The problem here is to find a solution how not to have unemployment but also to have a growth that is not polluting or bad for the environment. So um, we should talk about redistribution. We should also uh, talk about um, income and about uh, wealth. And these are the questions that we have to ask more in the future. Here it would be really interesting to look at the Spanish pers perspective uh, because we here in Germany we can say that we want to continue growth but what can be um, solutions to the conflict of, um, of this problem of the decoupling income and growth and uh, natural resources. How is the situation in Spain? You have had a recession for many years and we have a huge rate of unemployment because of this crisis. And I would like to ask you, Kema, about your point of view. Buenas tardes. Efectivamente, en España, en lo laboral sindical, se están produciendo una excisión profunda. 
course, um, in Spain we have a lot of we are facing a lot of problems in this area between the unemployed and uh, those who still hold a job. So it's we see an impoverishment, but uh, it doesn't affect everyone equally. So there are those that uh, still can can hold down a job, and um, um, and those that are unemployed are affected by impoverishment. Uh, both affected by impoverishment, but uh, as I said, not equally. So we have extreme poverty on the one hand, and 10% of the population is affected by that extreme poverty. We're talking about 2 million households that have no income whatsoever. There are many who have to scavenge the uh, waste bins in order to find s some food to eat. There is rising inequality in Spain as well. And this impoverishment has to bring us to a point where we are able to find a new way of organizing our, of our, of our societies. Uh, we have to tackle the issue of uh, competitiveness. And we should not fall back or rely on a development society that we had in 2007, so we cannot return to the place we were in in 2007. So we have an in increase of uh, social costs. We have even the policies that were in place back then, expensive policies, uh, expansive policies, for example. development, productivity, competitiveness, and also the increase of inequalities. This is what we have to do away with. We have to focus, we have to find our way back to concepts of the good living, and we have to decouple them from our uh, consumption model. If you are faced with uh, problems, uh, that means that these concepts have no standing, no ground anymore in our societies. They do not figure anymore in our societies. And um, under these conditions, we, we cannot um, sustain ourselves any longer. Placing access over uh, the well-being of people is not correct. The common good, understood not as the common goods of all, but in particular, understood as the eradication of the uh, worst problems that we are facing, the most severe problems, even though uh, a small minority is affected by them. If you are engaged in social struggles, you're not only fighting for your rights, you also have to take into consideration your responsibilities and your duties, not only vis-a-vis -vis the institutions, but also with respect to the social situation. There are things that we can do and things that we cannot control. There are always good and bad consequences. I have to reposition myself as an individual, and I have to break away, I have to do away with um, this market logic. We have to ask ourselves, how do we want to live? What are the modes of redistribution? How are we able, and to what extent are we able to redistribute the wealth of our societies? We expect that we are able, we think that we are able to do that, and I think we are ready at this very moment to do that. The uh, current situation, in this current situation, we are engaged in this very um, imperative debate, and we have to further develop this debate. Of course, you touched upon strategic issues, for example, our individual agency as well. Uh, just uh, let me come back to another aspect, and uh, Kim I touched upon it very lightly, but uh, let me give it back to Norbert Reuter. What are the constraints that are driving the system? 
and that uh, lead to the emergence of these distortions, these ruptures, the increase of social inequality. And Norbert, what is the debate within the German trade unions regarding this a these aspects? The redistribution question is on the top of the agenda for the German trade unions. We are a very rich country. We are one of the richest countries in the world. But it appears to be that uh, we have a f finance problem in some of the areas. And very quickly, we find out this is not due to a lack of growth or a lack of income. It is rather a question of how the incomes are distributed in the German society. And in the past, it was indeed the case that uh, the growth that we witnessed, even if it was small, we still managed to have an increase in, in uh, the income of the societies. But the majority of employees did not benefit from that. The real wages stagnated, have been stagnating uh, since 2000. The overall income uh, has increased a bit, but of course it benefited uh, the uh, top income earners, uh, which saw an increase of up to 40% of their incomes. So we, s we see very clearly that it is an issue of redistribution that we have to tackle very seriously. And one of the possibilities to bring about a new uh, redistribution, a new distribution, is to take into, is to strengthen the income situation of employees. And this is an issue of power as well. What are the trade unions able to do? And another possibility is the introduction of a minimum wage. So in order to break, uh, to some extent, the power of employers. I would just like to add one more thing that I find very crucial in this debate. We should ask ourselves if we, would, if we wouldn't have a redistribution um, uh, we had a redistribution from the uh, uh, income of workers, from um, worker incomes, to uh, the incomes of top earners and the profits of the companies. And when we look at this, we see that there were losses of 1.7 billion euros for employees. So that was a donation from the employees to the uh, top income earners and to those who profit from the system. And when you translate that into working time, you see that uh, employees in Germany could have two weeks more of uh, holidays in terms of the amount of uh, working time that they donated to um, to those who are profiting, they donated that to the industry. So we have to carry out a redistribution in those terms, a redistribution from top to bottom, not from bottom to top, as we did in the past. Now, how did this redistribution come about from bottom to top? Um, the collective bargaining partners, um, uh, the trade unions, uh, they were involved in uh, negotiations. But what can you say about the constraints that uh, uh, were the reasons or some of the reasons for this development. Um, of course, the uh, uh, bargaining partners, they are bargaining, um, uh, they are bargaining around uh, uh, many issues. For example, the working, working time reduction uh, or uh, income increases. And the result of these negotiations also depend on the power relations between employees and employers. So uh, the debate we had in the um, past was that um, there were wage restraints imposed on employees. And in the services sector, 
we have to see that in Germany, the wages for the service sector are the worst, the lowest wages compared to other industrialized nations. And this has to do with the fact that uh, traditionally in Germany, uh, the uh, care work is lower paid. And there are many aspects, there are many reasons for that. But the bottom line is that it is a question of power and of power relations. If there were more unionized workers in Germany, we would have more power and we would be a counter power vis-a-vis -vis the uh, employers in Germany. And just to add one more thing, in the uh, former, um, in former East Germany, in the bargaining, in the collective bargaining, we had to ask ourselves, uh, are we able to negotiate uh, and are we able to have strikes? Because if we don't, if we are not allowed to carry out strikes, to organize strikes, uh, basically what we're doing is uh, acting as beggars. So we had to look for people. We had to look for people who were um, who were ready to uh, to go on strike and to take action to fight for their rights. So we didn't have the upswing that was uh, projected. And uh, we used to have many people that were engaged, that were uh, very much involved in uh, strikes. But uh, this is not the case anymore. And when we are planning a strike, for example, from Verdi, from the Services Union Verdi, when we are planning a strike, we always have to ask ourselves, OK, which are the companies that would actually, or where are the companies where employees would actually support a strike and actually um, make that commitment to fight for their rights? So this is a, uh, a crucial issue in order to build counter power uh, against capital. So we'll have time for Q&A, uh, the first uh, round of Q&A. And if you have a question or a comment that you would like to give, please use the uh, microphone that's right here in front of us. This is for the um, interpreters and for our panelists who are uh, who need translation. But before we have our first Q&A, I would like to ask Christina Ax, from your perspective, what are the constraints that lead to things like uh, increased workload, int intensification of work, and the uh, redistribution of uh, labor. What are the constraints that led these developments uh, here in Germany, but also in other countries such as Spain? The um, constraints such as uh, downsizing um, were very negatively affected. Um, we have uh, entire sectors where uh, Ernest and Young and Co. were told that you uh, can use uh, certain processes uh, such as uh, outsourcing and leaner production. You can uh, uh, bring down, you can curb your uh, wage costs in order to increase your profits. And that uh, had the result, with the result that in, in many uh, sectors we saw not only um, a decrease of wages um, through severe wage cuts, but also um, it negatively affected the working conditions. That doesn't apply to the entire economy. I would like to stress that. There are the, the smaller and medium-sized companies where this doesn't apply as much as uh, to the uh, uh, bigger companies, where this is just a top-down approach and employees have no uh, say in that whatsoever. Uh, because the, um, the trade unions are more powerful there, and they uh, have a word to say about this as well. Let me just say something about the terminology. In this word redistribution, in German, verteilen, uh, contains the word sharing. And this readiness to share, 
I don't see this ready. I don't see that people in rich societies are as ready to share things with others as in other societies. Um, I saw that uh, recently. We see that in the uh, uh, industrialized nations, with respect to their immigration policies, uh, they cannot bear the uh, um, the idea or the prospect that they have to share their wealth uh, with uh, others that uh, come from from outside. So I think we have to revive revive that concept and that spirit of sharing. There are other countries in Europe that uh, are in a very uh, different situation that have to tackle the issue of uh, the redistribution of work and uh, wealth um, among other countries in, in their countries as well. So this is a, a, a German problem, but also a European problem, I would say. So we looked at um, some of the aspects in terms of the analysis. We looked at uh, counter strategies a little bit. We uh, saw that there are interconnections between levels of wealth and the, um, the levels of solidarity in societies and the readiness to share, the willingness of people to share. Now, I'd like to open up the floor uh, for our audience. Uh, if you have comments or questions, please step up to the mic. I have two questions. I have a social democratic background and um, I'm a proponent of redistribution, but at the same time I studied management, I studied economics. In redistribution in the classical sense, when you redistribute and uh, a wealth uh, from uh, top to bottom, uh, the result will be that uh, people uh, will consume more. Uh, what we see is that uh, uh, the uh, the rich, uh, the richer part of society, uh, they don't consume as much. That is what we learn from from economics and from business management. So the uh, number, the the number that was mentioned here, the figure that was mentioned here, 1.7 uh, billion euros as a donation from employees to capital. Uh, if that was, uh, if that is redistributed to the employees, they would, of course, consume much more. Um, and with respect to what uh, Norbert Reuter said, um, you referred to the industrial sectors, but when we talk about the service sector, for example, that is uh, very much tied in with uh, the uh, the social industry, and uh, their growth would not necessarily be something negative. So uh, my question is, do we have to differentiate between uh, good and bad growth? Is that awareness, do we have that awareness within the trade unions as well for this differentiation? Thomas Kesslering, I'm from Switzerland. You talked about productivity and productivity gains and the social, the negative social consequences, and we this have to has to be reduced later and has to be returned to nature. But that this has been ignored here at this panel uh, so far. But this does not apply to work. My question would be, do you discuss that in the trade unions as well? How to uh, return what we have produced uh, to nature? Our mobile phones are exported to Ghana or to Bangladesh where they are recycled or um, turned into waste products. That's a very good question. Thank you. I would like to know about a kind of vision to have uh, an image painted by you and a vision how could our society be? 
so if we had zero unemployment okay maybe we would have some people who are sick who cannot work today but how many work hours would we have if we did not have any unemployment thank you very much and one last question please there are many types of work that are not paid i think for example also the organization of such conferences as this which are very important i think but this is unpaid work and i would like to know if there exist any concepts or maybe you could enlighten me on the panel how we can integrate and also value this kind of work and not only see this as unemployment but also create a value uh, of this i have some technical um question to the technicians i think we have a kind of problem with the receiver here sorry could we find a solution for that please it's only this one receiver actually I will try to actually uh, repeat the questions if I understood them well. But actually the last question was very good because it leads directly to our second part about good life, good work and the question about uh, value. Uh, my question is also a little bit about good life. May I ask it? I was looking for some numbers on the internet which was not very difficult. For example, I was looking on the website of uh, the people caring for drug addicts. We have 15 million smokers, 10 million people who consume too much alcohol, 1.5 million people who are addicted to alcohol, many people are addicted to drugs or to, to medical drugs, and many people are addicted to gambling. And actually, we, these numbers do not include their families who are also victims of this fact. But if we talk about good life and good work, should we not promote this a little bit more? Should this not be the focus of our work? Very good. I think we will take these last two questions in order to lead over to the next part of our discussion. But I would rather like to start now with the first question. It was about a classic rebound effect. Actually, we could say that it is a rebound variation. If we have this redistribution, if we do not, uh, if we had not share made this difference, if would this have been a problem from the point of view of economy? This question is directed to Norbert but also to Kima I think also the question if we could promote support uh, services and whether this could be a kind of good growth instead of having a growth that is based on uh, industrial production is there a discussion about this going on and then also the relation of production and rebound or, um, and going back or recycling maybe also and about taking care of the waste that we produced would like to give the word to um, Norbert those are very difficult but nevertheless important questions I think that a top-down redistribute could lead to more uh, savings actually because when you have when you don't have a lot of income you can not have any savings of of course this is the logical way and if you have more income you have the possibility to save your money for whatever reasons 
So I think that if we take something from the people on the top who have savings and we give it to the people to the other people who did not have the possibility before to buy whatever they wanted or to save money, I think actually they would spend more money. So if the people stay like they are and con continue their con consume consuming things, I think that the consumption rate would actually increase. But there's also a different development where we see that if people have a certain level of income, well then they come into the situation that they use their prosperity in a different way. That means that they could renounce on working hours, and in the second step they could have a reduction of work hours. So that means that those people who already have some kind of prosperity and who have a sufficient income will be more likely to uh, decrease their work time instead of those people who do not have a sufficient income. So maybe we could um, tell people how difficult it is when we have more uh, consumption um, but I think that at the beginning the rate of consuming would increase but then after a certain time they would use their prosperity in a different way and I think but I think this cannot be a reason for us to renounce um, the, the the redistribution which is still very important the second question was about services I think this is our big opportunity because we know that services have more productivity gains than typical um, jobs in the industry. So actually we have the, the, um, the example of a hair cutter who still needs the same time to do a haircut than he used to do many times before. Since the 1970s, in Germany we have been working on the service industry as one important sector and I think it would be one ap possible approach to base our industry on services and then we would have uh, less productivity gains so um, then we would not have to work against growth via the means that we already mentioned. And I think that we can clearly see that in most or all industrialized countries growth is going back. We have uh, about 1% of growth in all those countries. So actually we are already on the path to a degrowth society because growth is decreasing. But it is decreasing very slowly. We have to do a lot of work in informing people but I think we already have a opportunity here to support um, this uh, this course and to gain, reach the situation that we want. Do you also talk about the possibility of a services society in Spain? You already talked a little bit about redistribution, but do you in Spain also see the problem of ecological aspects that will be exacerbated? What do you think about that? Actually, the increase of consumption again could be used against distribution, but for me this is kind of perverse. I think redistribution should be our first goal. Redistribution should reach a minimum level.
and we need to promote a close local economy. We need new models of um, energy. So an economy of proximity would be one thing. The services have a big uh, potential of uh, development. I think the same thing, especially in those uh, domains where we need a lot of workforce instead of a lot of technology or capital. Many fields of production can be transformed in a way that we need a lot of workforce rather than a lot of capital. In Pamplona, there is a company that uh, works in the waste disposal sector, and 80% of their costs are wage costs. So that means that they use very few technologies, but a lot of work. OK, the income is not uh, so big, but they have about 200 employees. And this is a very good example. In public administration, they could really have a look at this uh, model. In a village with 1,000 inhabitants, there are machines that clean the streets. What is the reason for that? Is that more cost effective? Is that uh, easier? Is that uh, more efficient? Actually, we use, we neglect the force that we have, the sources, the workforce that we have. We don't use that. This is absurd. The separation between, or the separation of work and well, actually, the workforce has to go through a market, but it does not have to be a global market. We can enter into a trade with someone. We can trade things. We can exchange things. And I think this is one basic thing that I wanted to say. I would like to ask something about that. Thus, the result of good work also could it be that uh, actually the work of um, the machines that you mentioned, could it be ma done by humans? This is not the only vision, but it's a possibility. Not only the distribution of work is important. I'm not only talking about the creation of, um, of employment. Actually, it would be better if we had to work less. But yes, it's true. There are some constraints given by nature. And we use more material of those things that exist in fewer numbers than those of which we have more. And I think we should use these things more efficiently with our human capaci capacities. Should we already start to work less? I'm not sure. Maybe yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Before we start to deepen the subject of good Arbit, I would also ask about the vision of uh, good labor from the point of view of trade unions. And Christine Ax already mentioned that she would like to talk about the creation of value and the value, the, est the estimation of and the respect of care work. So Norbert Reuter about the vision of trade unions. So the idea of good work means that everyone does a good job and is paid well for that. That would be the vision of the trade unions. But of course, we have the other side that wants um, exactly the opposite. They want to pay 
as uh, few. They don't want to pay much, uh, but they want as much work as possible. This is very difficult because we have a power struggle here. It is, it is very difficult to form this, to shape this, and to do um, good work because actually we have to define the working conditions. We cannot leave this definition to the market. We have to find guidelines in how we want to shape our work, how we want to shape the content of our work, so that actually the employees get more um, means of participation. We are talking about economical democracy. Of course, we have a democracy in Germany, but we not, do not have an economical democracy. So that means that we do not have a participation of most employees. There are some big companies where employees can participate, but there is no general structure in Germany where we can talk about economical um, democracy, which means that employees can take part in shaping their work. And one other thing that I would like to add about productivity gains, when we talk about more manufacturer labor, I think wherever it is possible that we use machines to do our work, we should do that. Because otherwise, we might uh, create, um, well, we should, in any case, not create bad conditions for the operator of the machine. But this means that the creation of value is done by machines. But these values would then have to be redistributed. That means that those who before created the values should still uh, take part in this redistribution of the wealth, should it be that either they get a new employment or rather they get an income without working at all because the machine replaced them. But it is just a, the question of distribution. So the more the productivity gains increase, the more we have to redistribute the uh, created values and products. In the past, we did not uh, succeed in taking part of the creation of value from those people possessing the machines and distributed to the people. And this was a big problem. So here we again have the question of power. Thank you very much. But I would like to ask some more things, and I would rather direct a question to Christina Ax. So we see that there is um, a problem between employers and employees. Actually, it's rather the employers who increase uh, the pressure and who uh, restrict the possibilities of good life. I think it was also asked if we didn't have uh, a more deep uh, problem because we have not some not no high estimation of certain uh, works for example care which is mostly done by women i'm sorry i have to um be a little bit provocative here now i would say that the trade unions have played an important role in the last years and we had a huge um, social reform in Germany in the past, past years where actually the government said that each child c could have two euros per day for food and actually the problem was that the social democrats and the trade unions played a huge part in this reform also a reform 
or policy policy that led to the fact that this the European South now has these huge problems. So I would like to say that it was not only the others, right? So the question about good work. I think this is a hugely important subject. I would also like to speak again about the subject of industrialization. The fact that we have to use resources in order to be able to work is uh, is also happening in the service industry because we had industrialization in this sector which led to negative consequences that people have to pay for with their health, for example. And I would like to talk about this industrialization very briefly because recently I read about a study that was um, um, done by the University of Vienna, which treated the subject of what makes people happy. They asked 300 bakers what their basic need is, their deep personal basic need. It was a really highly specialized uh, survey that they used. And they found out that the bakers, they were apprentices and uh, employers, and those bakers, what they really wanted was to bake their bread manually and not only put some things into the oven that were frozen. And I think that the industrialization of those fields had also very negative consequences. And I think this is closely linked, this work of the baker, to everything that we talked about. From the consumer's point of view, I can say that every one of us is um, living in a kind of um, division. He, we uh, are consumers on the one hand, and we are employees. We want to have a good job. We would like to have a good work that can satisfy us those jobs exist. I will talk about those uh, again a little bit later. But as uh, taxpayers, we want to pay as less taxes as possible. And I think these contradictions that we have in ourselves also exist inside of the trade unions. And I can't stand listening to that. We had some discourses, some discussions in Vienna, and there are some people who are complaining about the high prices of food, but they are not interested in the conditions of work and of life of those people producing the, their food. They are not interested in that at all. They just want to have cheap food. So. They also have this, they are divided. And at the same time, they um, do so that this is not possible anymore. They want cheap outputs, they want cheap products, and they want to increase pressure. They want to pursue the pressure. And generally speaking, we had the question about utopia. Actually, the workers' movement, at the beginning, their idea was that if we are highly productive, one day we would be able to harvest the fruits of our productivity and would be able to work less. That was our vision. It was not our vision to work more and more while living in an abundance of commodities. 
with and that we would suffocate in this abundance of commodity. So actually we had and we still have a lot of utopias but we kind of lost this vision and the debate of the minimal wage or rather the basic uh, wage is a idea that I support highly we would work less and then the redistribution of work would be uh, the solution of the problem and we have to discuss in how we can do that but I think that we will work less and the important question here is in under which conditions and in which framework can we redistribute the work who will manage that who will decide about that I am a supporter of the principle of freedom work under the conditions of freedom not only the condition of need will be the key of to satisfaction and to personal happiness that's it vielen dank ich würde ähm dir aber gleich mal kurz die möglichkeit geben no but you'll have the opportunity to reply to that as well and then Kima has the floor again to talk about uh, the role of uh, work time reduction because I think he has a very uh, telling example and then we'll open it up um, for the audience uh, for a Q&A again. But no, but you have the floor first. Of course the trade unions uh, are uh, to some extent uh, responsible for uh, past developments. But I would also like to point out that uh, we always had a strong position of opposition uh, and uh, the um, most striking example is actually our opposition to the Agenda 2010 uh, which implied um, uh, social cuts and uh, labor cuts. We revealed that this would uh, actually uh, spark a or, or spur um, a process of outcompeting between uh, the countries. So European countries would outcompete each other. Uh, you know the chancellor who uh, who uh, pushed that. We want um, a low wage sector in Germany. That was um, that was openly and explicitly um, said. And we uh, came out in strongly in opposition of that, and we organized demonstrations against that. So we we didn't take part in this. We weren't part of this. But um, of course, uh, our progress has led to the situation that other countries are in more uh, severe situations right now. The uh, um, uh, dumping uh, in terms of wage, in terms of uh, labor, we had have to. We would have to fight for an increase in wages. We have to fight for a um, um, a larger proportion of the wealth of the value that is created is um, allocated to the employees, to the workers themselves. Uh, of course. We, in the end, in this uh, competition game, you know, everyone out competing each other, trying to out compete each other, we will also be the losers of that game, I think. And this is a very uh, a dangerous development uh, that we uh, are trying to oppose as trade unions with all uh, the means that we have for that. Um, for example, the developments in uh, France right now are are very uh, dangerous for Europe, are very negative for uh, Europe. Uh, in the future, we will work less, of course, but I ask myself, who is we? Who is that we? The uh, workload will decrease for all, and uh, that will, this process of uh, reducing the workload will be uh, a chaotic process, of course, because the uh, result or the effect um, 
is that uh, if Germany loses its position as its 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 very advantageous position, where it can export a lot, um, I don't think. Uh, reduction of uh, the workload, reduction of work time will actually lead to uh, an increase in unemployment. So work time reduction is actually just uh, a redistribution of, um, uh, of unemployment. A redistribution of work leads to unemployment as well. And this is a very unequal process. So we can, uh, we are already expecting uh, a large-scale social protests, and I don't think that uh, the trade unions have enough power to to handle that. Uh, but the the export surplus, which basically means uh, more work, because we produce more here that is uh, things that are uh, goods that are consumed elsewhere. Uh, this is an absurd system. This is a farcical system that we have to uh, uh, overcome somehow. So. And that will be uh, the challenge to redistribute labor in such a way that uh, that it is uh, that it doesn't uh, exacerbate the inequalities. Um, so one of the problems will be that uh, uh, unemployment will also lead to um, a uh, increased scarcity of goods and needs can no longer be uh, satisfied. Um, in Spain, we see that uh, uh, already underway. Um, or they see the, we see the consequences of that. And with respect to the Agenda 2010, the idea of trade unions back then was actually not very, not very positive. Uh, the, the situation in Spain is probably not very different from that or similar to that. Uh, so what role can trade unions play with respect to models of work time reduction? Uh, what are the strategies that are required to uh, uh, actually organize these processes to create a different attitude, uh, uh, create a different, different conditions and a different environment? So, of course, the uh, position with respect to trade unions is also very negative in Spain. Uh, The trade unions have a very difficult role to play, I must say, in Spain. And at the moment, they are somewhat hiding. They are shying away uh, from these issues. For example, they uh, shy away from the issue of working time reduction. Unemployment uh, rates are at 20% in Spain. And there is a strong competition between the unemployed and the employed. I think in Spain uh, the uh, trade unions are clientelistic and those unionized workers, maybe their needs are taken into consideration, but uh, those who are not unionized, they lose out. And they can also not support us in our struggles. Redistribution of work has to be organized against capital and in favor of a positive progress and advancement of our societies. I think we should have a 20% reduction in work time, but that should also lead to reduction uh, of in income, of course. Uh, maybe not uh, to the same extent, maybe not a 20% cut of incomes. But we cannot um, apply 
these um, ideas to all workers uh, across the board. The public services in Navarra, where I come from, incomes have risen, and in the private sector, uh, they have risen even uh, um, even stronger. You have to consider the uh, uh, the scale. Uh, somebody earning uh, 700 euros a month uh, and somebody uh, 700 uh, 4,000 euros a month. There are certain uh, differences and uh, and inequalities. We have to push this issue. We have to be ready to push this issue. We have to become engaged and remain engaged in these issues. For example, we should avoid creating policies and laws that impose a working a working week a work week of uh, 42 hours while at the same time having uh, high unemployment rates of course the uh, situation has deteriorated a lot it's a lot more difficult it's a lot worse than 20 years ago i have my experience is, is, is very limited. Uh, ten years ago, we had 20% unemployment in Navarra, and uh, work time was reduced by one day per month. And I, I don't think uh, work time reduction is not uh, only and an ethical issue. Uh, it has a, uh, or it has an ethical, it doesn't have uh, only a, an ethical dimension, but it is first and foremost a, a political issue. So it was a political decision uh, that I took as well. Uh, later they told us that we have to work, that we, we have to increase our work time and we have to work 36 hours more in order to keep up production. We were supported by many organizations. Pamplona, where I come from, is a very uh, small town. And So there's a, there's a, there was a lot of confrontation between uh, employees and employers. I would like to talk about my understanding of decent work. I think we should work to trying to um, put a break on uh, capital and this notion of competitiveness. We have to overcome that uh, system, uh, but we have to do it ourselves because capital, uh, there's capital accumulation is is uh, um, is continuing, and. Uh, But we should try to put a stop to these processes and these developments um, by ourselves, or we should we should take it upon ourselves. And it has also, uh, with the uh, trade unions, also bear responsibility in that regard. With respect to technologies, I would say that uh, they use up a lot of natural resources and they replace uh, human labor and uh, uh, manual labor. When the wheel was invented, uh, that was, of course, uh, very beneficial, very useful. So if we have development, if we have uh, uh, innovation, uh, that can be something that can be uh, used for good causes. But uh, maybe we cannot continue uh, in the same way forever. 
Uh, I'm not an expert on that, but maybe we should ask ourselves uh, how we can uh, go on, how we can how we can move forward from here. So, uh, satisfying work, uh, decent work, should be necessary work, should be important work. It, there should be a meaning to it as well, because meaningful work. Uh, is definitely uh, uh, better work, uh, higher quality work, uh, and more decent uh, work. I don't try to uh, increase the value. By, uh, by living. Um, I cared for my mother, and that included uh, some very, uh, um, very dignified work as well, um, uh, being able to care for um, a, a parent. And that, uh, in a way, satisfies me. That, in a way, is a satisfying work. mental, uh, physical problems, the uh, material and uh, non-material problems. These are issues that we can uh, regulate ourselves, organize ourselves, uh, manage ourselves. We need to respect the dignity of individuals. And decent work should also enable us to live a good life, I think. But, of course, uh, the good life, there is no good life, uh, there is no um, one-fits-all um, definition of good life. And everyone, a definition of good life should uh, be able to include everyone and uh, apply to everyone. And I think a redistribution uh, has to be part of every uh, approach to reorganizing labor and reorganizing work. Thank you very much. I think that was also, uh, you also kind of summed up uh, very nicely. I think you, you touched upon other issues such as autonomy, uh, flexibility, um, self-determination, and uh, the um, development of faculties and uh, competencies. The autonomy, for example, to, to learn a craft uh, and not to be uh, uh, organized and um, by machines. I think Christina wanted to say something more on the redistribution of work. And then those of you who want to uh, give a comment, make a comment, or ask a question, uh, you, you could uh, get in line already in front of the uh, microphone here. Professor Max Perl from the uh, MPI in Rostock, he said that the 21st century will be the century or will see the redistribution of work. And together with him, I asked myself, how can we do that? How to do that? How to redistribute work? How can we do away with the growth imperative? We always say, or we need growth to ensure social security, to ensure employment, to ensure well-being. In order for all of us to have work, we don't need growth. Those that tell you otherwise lie. But we have to quest we have to ask ourselves how can we organize work? And that ties in with issues such as health. on the issue of uh, how much do we have to work, uh, how much workload is necessary, and how much working time is necessary. 
if we in order to produce the GDP that we currently have, we would actually have to work only 16 uh, hours per week per person in Germany. But uh, some do not start work uh, at 14, but later. So the working life uh, is not the same for all of us. So when you factor in all these uh, aspects, then we end up with 25 hours per work. In order to produce or, or to have the GDP uh, that we currently have, but the distribution of these 25 hours per week per person, that is the question, because we have to escape that uh, cycle that we're in. And that cycle means that uh, the way we organize work at the moment um, comes or goes hand in hand with a lot of suffering, with um, uh, reflected, for example, by the wave of burnout. The pressure of work has become almost unbearable. And that generates, uh, of course, uh, severe, uh, serious costs in uh, the health sector that have to be accounted for as well, and the uh, working life. We could actually ease the burden on uh, the um, uh, pension funds when all of us would work one year longer. In order to distribute or redistribute work equally among generations, we, first of all, we argue for uh, or we um, are in favor of um, a reduction of working time and also um, um, an increase of the pension age. I can give you many reasons for that. First of all, uh, that would increase our health. Um, if we, with a lower uh, pension age, there are more negative consequences to that than having a higher pension age. We can ease the burden on the pension funds. We have time to uh, uh, raise our kids and spend more time with them. So it also touches upon the issue of demography that um, is in part also one of the causes of the economic pressure on the labor markets. So when we distribute work differently, maybe 20 hours per week, and uh, try to also improve the quality of work, not the quality of the work, imp uh, improve work in a way that it is more, more decent, uh, we would actually be able to escape um, from that uh, supposed growth uh, imperative. So th these are some of the aspects that uh, come into play when we want to discuss these issues. And of course, when people work less, they are more healthy, they are more productive. So there are a lot of studies out there that uh, reflect that. Do you have uh, any comments? OK, one. Comment. We are a little bit short on time, so I would like to ask you to please be brief. Um, I'm going to have a session on this actually tomorrow afternoon. Uh, reorganizing work. Of course, we have to rethink work as well in order to reorganize work. So we have an absurd system of uh, continuous production. We have to uh, construct, we have to build uh, for the uh, building sector, we have to drive uh, for the car industry, we have to smoke for the tobacco industry. So production is driven by money and, and the result is a, a growth imperative. And the 
poor companies have to poor companies they have to keep on producing they have to continue producing and uh, we could restructure the economy in order to reduce uh, working time and I would like to propose a few uh, aspects, a few strategies, uh, how we can actually bring about a restructuring of the economy and the restructuring of uh, work and work as well. Redistribution is a very good idea. Many of the uh, um, uh, pioneers of the uh, um, post-growth movement, uh, the problem is that if we only work 20 uh, hours per week, uh, we we cannot afford our lifestyles anymore. Um, the basic income is, an, is one remedy for that. Do you see other uh, possible alleys? If there are no more questions, I would have another question. You proposed to change the working life um, of uh, people, to, l uh, to increase the pension age, to raise the pension age. When we look at uh, a GDP that includes the market transaction, but there's a lot that is ex excluded from GDP, such as the unpaid work, unpaid, unpaid care work. So is it not actually a false belief um, uh, if we say that uh, uh, in order to uh, remain or to uh, preserve the GDP that we have right now, we can simply uh, we can simply redistribute work in the way that you proposed, uh, without uh, factoring in the entire area of unpaid work, so the uh, reproductive area and the care uh, sector. Of course, uh, that is what you are referring to. Uh, in recent times. We've seen um, a, a trend that they are more and more incorporated into the market in order to uh, increase value creation as well. Uh, women are not allowed to stay home anymore uh, longer than uh, for longer than one year because they have to return to work. They have to um, organize childcare. They have to give them. Uh, so they have to go into the kindergarten. So there are many women who actually want to raise their children uh, on their own. But when they do this, they are labeled asocial, as asocial. So there's a debate, uh, there's a discourse um, in order to force women into the labor market. And I'm not a proponent of this. I'm not in favor of that. I said earlier, um, I'm proposing work under conditions of freedom. And I think the solution really lies in basic income. There are different models as to finance that. And we would have the wonderful situation that for the first time the labor market would be a labor market. We would call the labor market a labor market because the employees, the workers, uh, would have power they would be able to decide what kind of work they provide and for what cost, at what price. Uh, sometimes um, the, uh, um, there's work that uh, does not have to be paid, but still is very uh, satisfying. And there is work that has to be uh, remunerated because the uh, it entails a lot of uh, suffering, a lot of uh, negative consequences. But uh, the fact is that uh, those who uh, are not uh, happy at work um, are paid the uh, the best, and uh, those that are do that do the uh, the hardest work uh, that there is they are uh, paid the least. So we have to talk about our own priorities. Uh, how much important is money for me, and how much is important is my own well-being, my uh, own uh, satisfaction? And only with regard to machines, there's a nice uh, saying, there's a nice sentence that uh, basically expresses um, 
I'm not against machines, I'm not against technology, but I'm against technology where it is not necessary and we should be as we should be wise enough to be able to uh, decide be or differentiate between the two and know where the boundary is between them. So we should be able to choose work that uh, satisfies us. And and this uh, um, is not only this is not only possible for uh, academics or for scientists, but also in uh, in the crafts, um, and for example, a plumber can you know plumbing can be very uh, satisfying w w work uh, if you have good. Uh, if you have good working conditions, because you need as many practice uh, uh, as a pianist to be a good uh, to be a, uh, you, 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 to be, in order to be a good plumber, you need as many practice as uh, you need in order to be a good pianist. This is for. I have one more question for you, Kima. Maybe it was a little bit lost in translation, but if I understood you right. <laughs> That when you talk about redistribution, maybe we do not have to talk about those who already have a good income, but we need uh, compensation for those who would have a small income. Was this uh, what you were talking about? Yes, that was uh, exactly what I said. I wanted to stress two things. First, a reduction of working hours. And this should be decoupled from the reduction of uh, salary. And of course, the capital has to play uh, its part in it. So actually, the capital has to recompensate us when we work less. And uh, the reduction of income does not have to be the same for each salary. A salary of 700 euros cannot be reduced. But that does not mean that we should nevertheless uh, not reduce our work time. So if you have an income that is only sufficient for living, should actually rather be increased. And the reduction, the reduction of salaries should take place with the highest uh, salaries. And of course, uh, there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of possibilities to do that. I don't think that redistribution will be a universal solution to all of our problems, but I really think that the basic income is important. Thank you very much for the clarification. Also, the fact that redistribution of work will not solve all our problems, but that they will rather play a very important role. This leads to an important question and the third part of our panel. How can we reach these goals? What can be the instruments, the strategies, which can be the concepts to reach this goal? So when we talk about only the part of redistribution of work, which aliases would we new use, which resources would we use, or can this just be reached alone by the trade unions. I would like to ask this question to Norbert first. Okay, I talked about uh, working time, which is more and more important for trade unions, but this only works when the employers also support the idea. And uh, of course, the employees have to support this idea. Otherwise, it will be difficult to talk about work time reduction. But I would like to mention another point. It would be important to have a look at other countries 
Earlier we talked about unpaid work and about uh, the organization of this Congress where many people are not paid. I would like to um, point you into the, the direction of the Scandinavian countries. In Germany, if we had as many people working in public as administration as we have in Denmark or Sweden, we would need 4 million people more working full-time in public administration than we have now. So that means here we have the debate that we want as less public administration as possible and we want to save money in doing so. But the Scandinavian countries who are very successful have a different approach here. And such an organization of work because we would have more work in the public sector, this would mean that actually a lot of work coming from difficult situations or people coming from difficult social and money situations, those would have the possibility uh, to do their work in a public uh, frame. And we would also um, r solve the problem of unemployment because we have about 4 million people of unemployees. So instead of uh, decreasing the public sector, we should look at countries who pursue a different approach, who have more public administration and more work in the public sector. So this is also a kind of redistribution of work, but no, not only the work that already exists, uh, but or the work that is uh, analyzed, but also work that is unpaid and is not registered right now. And those works would be taken into the public sector. And then, of course, we would have direct access to the working conditions because the people would not be working for capitalist uh, companies who have to make profit, but they would be working for the public institutions, for the state. And I think that public institutions here are seen as something, something rather bad working for them, but in the Scandinavian countries the case is very different. And I think that this collective organization would be one approach. And afterwards, we can ask the question, how do we redistribute work? Because first, we need a bigger um, stock of, of labor, and then we can redistribute it. There is so much work going on. Um, also in, in, the, in the public sector that we do not see at the time. And I should, I think we should really have a look at the best practices going on in Scandinavian countries. Thanks a lot. Before I give the question to someone else, I would like to say something that I have the impression that many discussions in the degrowth movement do not talk about public sector. They talk about grassroots, about self-organization, self-rule, uh, self-initiative. And maybe someone from the audience would like to comment on this. One question that you could ask after your statement, Norbert, would be that actually on a structural level, the conditions of quality of life and working conditions can be, uh, can take place in the public, but the question is how can we reach this fact? Because here, the public sector is one domain where we want to save uh, most money, actually. Is this a special situation for Germany? Is it maybe the same situation in Spain? What do people in Spain think about uh, the public sector? How do they see work in the public sector? And then 
also the movements campaigning for a good life could they see this as a possible solution yes the public sector and public services should play a central role in the redistribution of work. The problem is the following. The public sector today is administered and managed like uh, private companies. They have incorporated the capitalist way of thinking and so we uh, imposed the model of capitalist thinking to the <laughs> public sector. So this should be in the foreground, in our focus, these services. Because society wants to have less unemployment. This would have, of course, economic advantages. We do would not have to pay unemployment um, wages. And nevertheless, this is not the case. I do think that this is the sector which is most um, where it is mostly possible to redistribute the work, but then this should go out from the public sector into the pub private sector. Many private companies work for the public sector, for public administration. And then we would have to fix conditions for those companies working for the public institutions uh, concerning the working conditions. And then this should expand to other private companies not working for the public sector. So actually public institutions should be the beginning to open new paths. concerning alliances and cooperation. I don't really trust uh, in that that can be expressed in the name of institutions. I don't think either that we can neglect them, but I think we have to go beyond the institutions. We have to reach the people, we have to reach the individuals. I want to talk to you as a person and not as a member of uh, this or that institution. I think that is really important. In Pamplona, I work uh, in the domain of unemployment and uh, precarity and in the sector where we don't have a minimum wage that can secure a basic living. Those uh, are not problems that are linked but this is actually only one basic problem. What we have to do is to put all these problems together and find one solution. We have to work into this direction, into a direction that means mobilization as an organization. We need organizations and institutions in initiatives that are flexible, that are not stuck in one structure, but that keep moving. And where we, as individuals, are part and not we as members of uh, or representatives of institutions. But of course, the political level is also important. Some people talk about policy as if they would be talking to a wall. But actually, we have to re um, take our p possibilities of participation in politics. 
we have to regain the, those possibilities, not only for uh, for the policy world, but also for our private life. So we have to work. Um, we have to act on politics, and not only in the private in our private life. Right now, there are certain measures to take political decisions where we have to exercise an influence. We have to retake this. We have to break the current system of political parties. And the system is also reproductive and repetitive. And it creates social differences that are absurd. Of course, we will never reach a perfect democracy. But we have to introduce mechanisms uh, for improvement and mechanisms, mechanisms of control. And that means that we have to implement those uh, measures and the people have to take responsibility. We need mechanisms that assure the possibility that people can lose their, their post if they do not take uh, good decisions. We need an action that looks for uh, relations and linking of uh, different people. In certain fields, we might have to go back a little bit. We always want to be the protagonists in our organizations. There are so many organizations that are striving to gain visibility. And we try to rentabilize what we do and actually we are rentabilizing more than we are actually doing. We have to break out of this scheme. We have to break out of many things. And we have to strive for well-being for all. I don't know, I don't really know whether we are questioning our society right now or whether we should rather be questioning if our society is possible such as it is or if we are not just um, going into the direction of uh, catast catastrophe. And maybe the things that are valid today will not be valid tomorrow. We have to find a position in this situation and we have to strive for improvement. Okay, that was uh, really interesting and was a vast um, contribution. I'm not sure if I really understood everything, but I think one thing was made clear. However, we want to reach the uh, changes, we cannot delegate our responsibility. We cannot give the responsibility to other organizations. We can, of course, work together with them, but we cannot expect a change without working or um, taking action ourselves. Well, um, thank you very much for that. And now for concluding my last question. The goal of um, change is clear and it is also clear that we have to act ourselves. Uh, but well, what could m maybe be the role of trade unions, Robert, in this, in this action? Trade unions are one of the big players in our, in our country. I think apart from the churches, they are the organization with the most members in our country. So we can actually reach a lot of things. We and what we have to do is um, 
give some proposals how things could be different and I think the train unions play a major role in how to show people how work could be organized differently like for example working time reduction but this can only happen if we uh, if our members will be active and that can only be if we will have uh, developments concerning the income when the people have less stress when they are relieved because they do not have to worry about their uh, employment so we should really um, secure the well-being of people we have to improve the conditions of um, of the life of the people and one big step is the minimum wage that is coming it is not coming like we wanted it we will have a minimum wage of 850 8 euro 50s um, per hour which is not enough but still it is a big step in taking some of the pressure off the people so in order that they can act freely afterwards and I think another thing that is linked to the this uh, discussion is that we have to defend ourselves we talk a lot about the European Union and the free trade agreements actually the public sector is debated in this um, field because actually it should be fixed uh, that the public sector should be forced onto the market and I think many of you are active in the struggle against the free trade agreement we have to be careful that uh, we will not have a public sector that will be completely kept um, privatized and I think that the working conditions of many many people will be uh, threatened when the public sector is exposed to the private industry to the economy I think we really should protect ourselves against these developments I am of course talking about TTIP and maybe we can link the degrowth movement to the campaign against TTIP and uh, find some alliances in order to protect ourselves against the deterioration of working and life uh, conditions that are going to be imposed on us I am really afraid that if we do not um, succeed in stopping this then this will be a huge disadvantage for all of us because the companies will have so much more power so we really have to improve working conditions but first of all we have to stop the deterioration of working conditions this should be our primary goal right now this leads very well to the thing that Christine would like to say afterwards we will also have a little time for some comments and questions and a few minutes uh, after half past four we should conclude our session and Christine will talk a little bit I really liked uh, your formulation and uh, I was uh, thinking about the kidnapping of the mythical figure of Europe I think that the depolitization of Germany in the last 20 years um, plays a huge role I think you were talking about asynchronous mobilization so how can we succeed um, in uh, in debating in the media and um, how can we 
keep this, uh, um, how can we uh, hide this um, debate? So I think P Actually, I'm a, I'm a bit frustrated uh, because uh, I'm, I think there's a, a lack um, of uh, degrowth. So degrowth is not debated enough here, I think. Um, I'm active in the uh, basic income, struggle for the basic income, and because we are starting from, our starting point is uh, a country that has a lot of excess, a lot of surplus. So. Uh, degrowth for me means we produce what's necessary and not what the market uh, requires because people need less things but at the same time that also means that the state has uh, uh, you know that there's um, um, uh, revenues are uh, state revenues public revenues are cut as well so uh, and uh, we have to ask ourselves how to um, uh, finance a basic income. Uh, Germany is one of the richest countries in the world. You've said it, but uh, we, and, and you know, according to my understanding of degrowth, um, we need more self-organization, uh, uh, urban involving urban gardening. Um, and, and different forms of self-organization. And we have to think about issues of uh, technology as well. When we don't make use uh, as much use of technology as we did, how uh, there's not going to be uh, automation, for example, to the extent that we have it now. So all these issues have to be taken into account when you want to reorganize a work. And the question also is how to do it. Because you have to do it within, you know, while this entire machine is, is, is working, is, 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 fu is functioning. So you can redistribute, um, but what happens after redistribution? So I'm, I'm missing that from the, ba from the debate a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
maybe we'll have the possibility to talk about that later. But uh, um, the question, uh, uh, how does a reorganization of work relates to basic income that uh, maybe we can talk about that uh, later because we would need uh, a different session. From the perspective of uh, anthropology, is um, a basic income, organizing a basic income actually feasible or not? Because is it can we conceive of a situation, uh, in, in, you know, psychologically, in terms of psychology and in, in, in terms of our mental uh, structures, uh, without uh, uh, so much work, for example? Of course, there would be benefits to that, because uh, we don't want we there would not be so much pollution. Uh, if people don't want to become uh, bankers or managers anymore. We, uh, in, in ancient times, um, we, uh, or in, in prehistoric times, maybe we uh, In ancient times, we used to have to work a lot more. We used to have to put in a lot more effort in order to sustain ourselves. And maybe we'd, we would have to come back to such a, a system. Um, I would also like to mention that uh, uh, during uh, your studies, of course, you should be supported. And there's a, um, a system. Um, that is in place already that's uh, working pretty smoothly, I think, and that's also very positive, but afterwards you should be able to stand on your own feet as well. Okay, I would uh, give our panelists the opportunity to respond after that uh, last comment here. Reducing the working hours was seen as a remedy, as a solution um, of the problems of reorganizing work, uh, job sharing, for example, how to uh, come up with uh, good role models, then um, uh, taking leadership. Maybe we can have a work, we can reorganize work in a way that uh, people don't have to work uh, maybe uh, 60 or 70 hours a week. But uh, um, sometimes our mentality, our mindset, um, our, uh, our image of work uh, is that um, uh, often we are satisfied or we uh, value if somebody works a lot uh, then because it gives us a sense of, uh, uh, of achievement. Um, um, uh, of course, you're referring to 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 drudging, uh, to to uh, slaving away, um, and um, to the to the daily grind, uh, uh, if you will. And of course, you 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 um, um, very rightly you refer to um, uh, that we have to change that mindset and uh, come back to a more uh, reasonable um, uh, image of work. Keynes talked about the 30-hour week in the 30s already. Um, old Adam or Eve, we have to say. Um, these 20 to 30 hours should be sufficient to, uh, to satisfy uh, our needs. And also the need to be active and to uh, to do something uh, to so we all also need a certain level of uh, work a certain workload to to feel needed in a way and to uh, I have to say that I'm not a proponent of basic income because I haven't seen a concept yet that uh, has laid out a plan that would uh, really be feasible um, 
because there are many issues that have to be taken into account. There is the proposal of an unconditional basic income, but uh, so we, we, we have to differentiate. There is one proposal uh, of a basic income. There are other proposals for an unconditional basic income. Uh, how is that going to be financed? Uh, we cannot go into detail, of course, and we cannot debate all of these issues, but there are many questions uh, remain open. But uh, I have to say, uh, I haven't been convinced um, by those who uh, are proposing uh, these, uh, these projects and these, these concepts. So before you distribute it, before you uh, propagate it, uh, before you promote such a product, you have to uh, come up with the uh, right arguments. You have to be able to back it up with the uh, um, uh, right arguments. Maybe we can add a session or propose um, a session on how working time reduction relates to, um, or how can it be connected to uh, concepts of basic income. Okay, let me sum up uh, the last questions and comments. Um, what about the degrowth perspective, uh, work and motivation, and uh, 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 high workloads, intensive workloads as an ideal, as the ideal uh, in our uh, work-based society and uh, work-addicted society? Reducing work time doesn't mean that we uh, work more or longer hours. But there's a difference between uh, uh, wage labor and um, uh, so paid work and unpaid work. So there are these two forms of work. I have to say I am in favor of a basic income, and it's a very important debate for us to have. I think it would be a good step, it would be a step in the right direction. In, in my country, where the situation on the labor market uh, is very dire, Um, a basic income would uh, actually relieve uh, workers of the uh, um, of the imperative, or workers who are forced to take on any job simply because they don't have any money and they have to uh, deal with the working conditions and uh, the low wages they receive. I think 80% of the society would be in favor of uh, working. It's not that people don't want to work, I think, even with a basic income. Because basic um, income will not lead a situation where people don't work anymore, because it was an, but it would enable us to work under conditions, uh, under uh, dignified and decent conditions, and do the work that we actually want to do. Christina, you have the floor. Uh, for once again concluding our session. Let me come back. Uh, do you think uh, basic income is feasible under degrowth conditions? Degrowth means we don't, we're not going to grow anymore, which means we're going to uh, we're going to next year we're going to produce as much as we produced this year or maybe it means that in five years we're going to produce only uh, the amount that we produced uh, uh, the level of production will be equivalent to the level of production last year. I think you, the issue is that we can only distribute or redistribute uh, what we actually produce in one year. I think you can you can distribute everything that's that's there, everything we have. I think. So the question I would like to ask is, what do we want to produce? What about the quality? Let's talk about the quality of the uh, GNP that we are producing. Uh, let's say we would have the uh, ability or we could decide 
what is produced. We would have a direct influence on GNP. And we should do that anyway. Because that's necessary in order to bring about a political process that organizes exactly that. Under the conditions of change, we have to be able to say what is necessary, what can stay, and what has to go. And I'd like to um, speak in favor of uh, effort. Because I think that one problem in our contemporary society is that um, we um, consider things not to be uh, even not not to be worth even our effort to use them. So we don't value them anymore in a way that we think uh, this is actually uh, good or this is a thing uh, that I want that I want to use. What about intrinsic motivation of people? For example, when people uh, actually see, have a sense of, uh, of, of, of value, uh, they value things, and people see that the value of things is inherent. So things have an inherent value. And I think that um, and the um, I think it creates a lot of uh, suffering when we as a society, as, as people, the life that we cannot live because uh, of this mental underload, because uh, we cannot evolve in the way that we would like to evolve. We have a lot of faculties, a lot of uh, uh, competencies that we want to live out. And if we cannot do this, this creates a lot of suffering. We shed a light on a few aspects uh, when it comes to reorganizing word from a perspective of degrowth. We uh, um, we deepened uh, our discussion also from the perspective, also in terms of uh, the dimension of anthropo anthropology. Uh, we mentioned some of the obstacles, such uh, some of the obstacles um, and the, s the stumbling blocks when it comes to realizing decent work. And what are the potentials for alliances? between uh, uh, different movements and organizations, we see that uh, we have to act now um, because we see that uh, these alliances are necessary vis-a-vis -vis the um, uh, official, the dominant politics that uh, wants more of the same with the free trade agreements such as TTIP that we see right now. So we uh, see, we saw the articulation of uh, a political will, a political motivation that uh, will uh, remain, I think, um, on the agenda. Um, so, and I think that is reflected also in the agenda of the Hans Böckler Stiftung. So, I think we can end on an optimistic note in that sense. I'd like to thank our panelists, and I'd like to thank our interpreters. Thank <laughs> you.